Lord, I find you in the seeking. Lord, I find you in the doubt. And to know you is to love you. And to know so little love side. Jesus. 
Good morning, boys and girls. Hi, Pastor Joe. I'm so glad you're here, Lenny. I want to show you a magic trick, okay? okay? You know, in the Old Testament, the Israelites were in Egypt, and God brought them out of Egypt, and there was a big body of water called the Red Sea, and Moses prayed and what raised his hands, and you know what happened to the sea? Yeah. It parted, and the water disappeared. And so, I brought some red cups to make us remember the Red Sea. And I brought some water to remind us of how the water disappeared. And so, I'm going to show you a little trick. I'm going to pour some water in here like that. And remember, it's this cup. But I'm going to mix the cups up and see if you can find it, okay? Keep your eye on the one that you think has got water. Which one? You're so good, you're right. Now I'm gonna pour the water in here. And then keep your eye on that cup. I'm gonna mix it up and try to hide it from you, okay? Because we don't know where the water went. So, where'd the water go? Oh, that is so good, okay. <laughs> Now I poured the water in this cup, so it's not in that cup anymore, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not in this cup. Where, which cup is it in? No, it was which cup? Yes, yeah, right. It's in this cup, see? So I'm going to put it back in that cup. Now keep your eye on it real close. Now where's the water? You are so good. You are so good. Now keep your eye on it again because there's no water in that one. There's no water in that one and no water in that one. Which cup's got the water? Nope. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so keep your eye on the water cup. You remember which one it is? That's right. Okay, keep your eye on it. Now, which cup do you think? Well, if it's in this cup, then it's not going to be in that one, right? Mm -hmm. hey, oh, don't look. If it's in this cup, it's not in that one, right? Mm -hmm. And if it's not in this cup, then it's safe to do that, right? Mm -hmm. You still think the water's in this cup? It disappeared. Where'd the water go? God made the water disappear. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, boys and girls, for coming to our children's sermon. See you at church. Well, good morning and welcome to our Sunday worship service. I'm Joe Taylor, pastor of Southern Oaks Church in Kerrville, and I'm standing here at the um, Coming King Foundation Garden. Isn't it beautiful? Max Greiner has erected a beautiful cross and a lot of people have funded this to put this thing together. Uh, God has provided a whole lot, provided Max great skill and, and uh, uh, art skill and sculpturing. And so I'm standing here in the, in the garden and I wanna invite you to pray with me now and let's ask God to anoint this message and to anoint me so that we can worship him better and live more like he wants us to. Would you bow your heads with me and pray, please? Our gracious Heavenly Father, you're just such an awesome God and you provide everything that we need. Open our eyes, Father, so that we can see your plan and your purpose and your path. We pray, Father, that you will direct our steps and that we will be pleasing to you and, Father, that you will grow our faith. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I'm going to postpone preaching about the walls of Jericho until next Sunday because right now I, I want to just go back a little bit into last Sunday's message about how God delivered the Israelites out of Egypt. Now, as you know, there were ten plagues that God demonstrated through Moses' prophetic words and Pharaoh finally said that, he could, you know, that God's people could go. And so they were heading to the Red Sea when Pharaoh changed his mind and came after the Israelites with all of his army and with chariots and soldiers. 
And so now they've got the Red Sea in front of them and they've got the Egyptian army behind them. And so they start crying out and praying and, and God says, get your people to move forward. Tell the Israelites to go forward. Now, when they stepped into the river, into I mean the sea, the Red Sea, God parted the waters and they were delivered and walked through dry ground. Now, the New Testament tells us that the Old Testament is a teacher and a tutor and an instructor for us today because we're to learn about God, we're supposed to learn about His provision, and we're supposed to learn about ourselves. And so what can we learn from the um, dividing of the Red Sea? Well, we can learn that, that when we are faced with an obstacle and we are seeking God and we are trying to follow Him and an obstacle comes, what happens? Well, He provides. He provided dry ground for them to march across the Red Sea. And then they have a big celebration and they go deeper into the wilderness and they get real thirsty because they've now drunk all the water that they brought with them on their uh, journey from, from Egypt. So they're thirsty and they cry out. You remember this from last week. They cry out because they don't have water and they finally get to some springs, but the water is very bitter. And so God tells Moses to cut down a tree and throw it into the water and it turns sweet. And so here's the second time that God provides. They are faced with an obstacle and the Israelites do what most of us do. They start grumbling about how thirsty they are and they at least had water back in Egypt. In fact, when they were faced with the Red Sea, they were grumbling to Moses, why didn't you just leave us alone back in, in Egypt? So both times there's a pattern. They come to an obstacle and they start grumbling. But somebody is smart enough to pray and to seek God. And in those two instances, it was Moses. And so Moses, he cries out to God and, and God provides. Now, a few days later, all their food that they brought with them runs out and they're hungry and they're starting to complain again. So here they're following God and yet they have an obstacle and they have a need. They're very, very hungry. And so they start crying out to Moses, at least back in Egypt, we had some food to eat. And why did you bring us out here to die of starvation? So, so Moses, he prays and cries out to God and, and God does something neat. Now this is, in, um, this is in Exodus 16 and it's also in Numbers 11 if you'd like to read that a little bit later. So what God says is, okay, I'm going to do something new. It's never been done before. In the morning there's going to be a dew all over the ground and when the dew evaporates, Exodus 16, when the dew evaporates, there's going to be a fine wafer-like substance on the ground and it will, it will look kind of like coriander seed and it will have the taste of like a wafer dipped in honey. It's going to be awesome and I'm going to provide it every morning for your people. Now this is what Moses told the people to do. Quit your complaining, God's going to provide. And so then the next morning they wake up and as they come out of their tents, there's this, this substance all over the ground. And they go and they get on their knees and look at it. They pick it up and, and they say, what is it? Or what's this stuff? Now, in the Hebrew, that phrase, what is it? Or what's this stuff? In the Hebrew, it's manna. And it kind of stuck. They've called it manna ever since. So as the Israelites are on their knees outside the tent every morning, picking up like two quarts of manna for each family, they cry out to Moses and say, what is it? What's this stuff? And Moses says, it's bread 
that God has provided, God has given you bread from heaven, and it's His provision. So every morning, they go out and they gather up this manna, and everybody had enough, nobody had too little, and, and you know, when I, was, when I was growing up, my mama always had enough food for, for all of us to have firsts. But I was the youngest, and, and I learned that there wasn't always enough to have seconds. And so sometimes I'd say, Mama, can I have seconds? And she'd say, you have plenty. <laughs> so there is always plenty when what God was providing. So they're out there, and they're picking up this wafer-like thing. Well, they have to get creative with how to cook it. You know, the Bible says, and in Numbers chapter 11 that they, they uh, boiled it, they mushed it and made flour out of it, they fried it, it tasted like it had been cooked in, in um, olive oil, and so they're having it every morning for breakfast, they're having um, manna cakes, uh, they're having Cheerio manas, they're having honey bunches of manna, and they're having manna with bananas. That's my favorite. And so then at lunchtime, they would have manna burgers and they'd have manna salad and they'd have manna roni. And my favorite is they had manna cotti. They just had to be creative and learn all these different ways to make manna. Well, after a while, they started grumbling again because they got tired of manna. And so, so God finally said, you know, I'm tired of all their complaining and their... their um, not being thankful. And they said, well, we want some meat to eat. At least back in Egypt, there was meat to eat. And so God said, okay, you want meat? I'll give you meat. And so God flew over the camp of Israel, all these quail, and they could just knock them out of the sky. And God said, I'm going to give them meat to eat. They're going to have meat to eat, not just one day, not just five days, but for a whole month until the meat is coming out their nostrils. It's in the Bible, really. It's in Numbers chapter 11. And so there is a pattern here. They come up to an obstacle and they start complaining. Finally, somebody starts praying and putting their trust in God and God does something new and he provides. And they said to Moses, what is it? And Moses said, God provides. It's bread from heaven. And so the next time they're thirsty, God provides. They're hungry, God provides. Now, you may not know this, but the journey from Egypt to the promised land, if you were just to walk straight, 11-day journey, but you say, but didn't they walk around the wilderness for 40 years? Yeah, they did. And I'm going to explain to you this morning why. It's, it's the bulk of our message today. You see, it was only a few days before God brought them right to the brink of the promised land. He had provided a way through the Red Sea. He had provided water. He had provided manna. He had provided meat. And just not even considering everything that he did to the Egyptians and to Pharaoh. I mean, so you would think after a few weeks that God's people would say, you know, this is the promised land that, that God is taking us to. And God provides, and he promised. That's why it's called the promised land. He promised, and we're going to believe his promises, and we're going to take this land which God has provided there again, God's provided. So now, they get right to the edge of the promised land. And, and so Moses says, okay, now we're going to send some spies, 12 spies, into the promised land to, to determine and, and to strategize the best way to conquer the land. And he says, now while you're there, he was talking to the 12 spies. While you're there, I want you to kind of 
check out the produce and check out the crops and, and see if it's a fertile land and, and come back and give us a report because this is what God has been promising to our forefathers for hundreds of years. So the 12, the 12 spies, they, they go into the promised land. And after a while, and this is in Numbers chapter 13, after a while, they come back. And in fact, let me just read it to you out of Numbers 13. It's a fabulous story. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, send out men who can spy out the land of Canaan, which I'm going to give to you. You shall send a man from each of their father's tribes. Now these are the names. Joshua, Caleb, you remember them? Do you remember the other ten? Shamua, not, not the orca whale, but Shamua, Shaphat, Palti, Gadiel, Gadi, Amiel, Sether, Nabi, and Gaul. Now, isn't it interesting that we remember the names of Joshua and Caleb, but we don't remember the other ten names. So, God sends these men in. Moses commands them to go in. And then when Moses sent them into the land of Canaan, he says, go up into the hill country and see what the land is like, whether the people who are living in it are strong or weak, and whether there are few or many. And how is the land in which they live? Is it good or is it bad? How are the cities in which they live? What are they like? Open camps or do they have walls and fortifications? And so how's the, how's the land itself? Is it fat or lean? Are there trees in it or not? Make an effort then to get some of the fruit of the land. Now, so they went up and they spied out the land, verse 21. Now, verse 22, when they had gone up into the land, they saw, they came to Hebron, where Ahiman, Shahai, and Talami, those are hard words to express, but they are descendants of the Anak. Now, who are the Anak? <laughs> we'll get to that. Then they came to the valley of Eskol, and from there they cut down a branch with one single cluster of grapes. And these grapes were so big that they carried it on a pole between two men. Like the way that uh, uh, the old pioneers would carry the carcass of a, a deer that they had shot. It was that big of a cluster of grapes. It's not that there were that many, it's just that the grapes themselves were more like grapefruit than grapes themselves. So they came to the Valley of Eskol, and from there they cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes, and they carried it on a pole between two men with some of the pomegranates and figs. Now that place was called the Valley of Eskol because of the cluster which the sons of Israel cut down. Now when they returned from spying out the land at the end of 40 days, they proceeded to come to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, and they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Thus they told him, and they said to Moses, We went into the land where you sent us, and it really does flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit, the grapes. Nevertheless, the people who live in the land, they're strong. The cities are fortified and very large, and moreover, we saw that the descendants of Anak lived there. Amalek is living in the land of the Negev, and the Hittites and the Jebusites, and the Amorites, and the Termites. That's not in there. I just threw that in there. We should, and then they all lived there. So then Caleb quieted everybody before Moses and said, By all means, let's go up and take possession of this land, for we will overcome it. But the two spies, I mean the ten spies, they gave to the sons of Israel a bad report. This is what they said. The land through which we have gone in spying it out, it's a land that eats its inhabitants. 
All the people who we saw in it are men of great size. Also, we saw the Nephilim, who are the sons of Anak, and we became like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. So, the giants lived there. Years ago, I did a study on the, on the different tribes and races of, of giants, and you heard me read some of them, but they were all part of the giant race called the Nephilim. I found that there were five predominant tribes of giants, and Goliath that David uh, fought he came from one of these tribes. He had four other brothers. Anyway, one of the tribes was called, it, get this, you ready? They were called the Troglodytes. They just sound vicious, don't they, and ferocious. So, so 10 of the spies said, there are giants that live there. They are too strong for us, and we cannot take them. But Joshua and Caleb, they said, what are you thinking? What are you talking about? Has our God not delivered us from the Egyptians? Did he not part the Red Sea? Did he not provide water and turn it sweet? Has he not given us manna from heaven and quail from the sky? Our God is able to deliver us. And he goes on to say, we have God's favor. We have God's blessing. And those giants will be afraid of us because God has not given them his protection. So now, if the Old Testament is a lesson to us, it was also a lesson to the Israelites. In every situation, God provided they had a need, somebody prayed, and God provided. Why do we not remember the name of the ten? It's because they did not believe. You see, Jesus said, if you believe in your heart and you profess with your lips, you're saved. That's Romans chapter 10. You see, if if we profess what comes out of our heart, there is a connection there. And I want to get to that in just a moment. I want to give you, I want to give you four points from today's message. Point number one, the promised land, you've got to be prepared for it. And there is a school for the promised land. Many of you have had grandparents that have said that, when you ask them what school did they go to, they said, well, we went to the school of hard knocks, meaning that they had to learn from their hard experiences. And I love education, but education that just focuses on facts that we can regurgitate for a test, that's not enough. You need to be able to learn how to apply those facts. You need to be able to understand what those facts mean in your life and how they can benefit you. So point number one is there is preparation or schooling for your promised land. Point number two, your words, good or bad, come from your heart. Belief comes from your heart. And what these 10 spies did was they pronounced from their mouth what they were believing in their heart that they could not take the land. Now, without God, they couldn't. But basically, they were saying that God was leaving them out of this miracle. Basically, they were saying they did not have enough faith to believe that God would deliver them. So point number two is your words, good or bad, come from your heart. Jesus said, from the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. Jesus said, it's not what goes into your mouth that defiles a person. It what, it's what comes out of his mouth. Because what comes out of our mouth reveals what is in our heart. Proverbs 18, 21 says this, Death and life are in the power of the tongue 
and those who are proficient with their words will be rewarded. So quit saying what you can't do and what can't happen and how terrible things are. The next point. When they said the word manna, they were asking God a question. What is it? What is it? And the answer came from Moses. God provides. And so they bring back this cluster of grapes. What is it? Well, it's what God has provided for you. They need to stay on the path in order to get grapes and milk and honey. In Psalm 25, verse 4, it says this, Show me the path where I should walk, O Lord. Point out the right road for me to follow. Now, although you and I might walk a different path, there's really only one way, and that's the way of Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. That's why I like to call people who say they believe Christ followers. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, I know them and they follow me. So it's not a matter of just believing facts in your head. It's, it's applying those facts to your life. And so just believing that the Bible is true or just learning facts about God, that's not enough. Even Satan knows facts about Jesus. Even he believes that Jesus is the Lord. But you need to apply it and let Jesus be your Lord. Next point, number four. Manna, what is it? The answer is God has provided. God has provided you grapes. There are grapes for you, but there are giants. <laughs> They're your grapes, though. Go get them. Well, but the giants, they're big. Well, duh. But so is our God. Do you think that the Red Sea wasn't big? Do you think that the Egyptian army wasn't big? Do you think that it wasn't a big, huge deal to feed millions of Israelites manna and quail? You see, God is always trying to teach us how to have faith in Him. He's not trying to give us a content test. He won't ask us how many scriptures we've memorized, although the more we've memorized, it will be beneficial. What he will, though, want us to do is to take his word and apply it by faith and follow him. So, so every morning on this journey, God provided food in the morning. So, if you want manna from heaven, maybe you better get out of bed and go outside and get on your knees and find God's manna for you. If you want manna from heaven, maybe every morning you need to go get it. It's, you see, God's Word is there and His presence is there. That's why Jesus said, if you want to connect with God, go into a room and shut the door where you don't have any distractions and focus on Him. That's where the miracles are, is when you go out in the morning, the first thing every morning, and gather your manna. Now, if you will learn the secret of gathering your manna, my uh, daughter has been staying with us during this time of being uh, shut in and homebound and uh, my daughter from California and she came up with this she's had an experience with a, a food product called Hello Fresh and this is I'm not getting paid for them but it's just an excellent menu and you order it from this company and they send it to your porch can you imagine? And they send instructions and everything you need. They, if it's vegetables or meat or sauces or seasonings, you don't have to go to your cabinet for anything. It's all in the box. And it's everything you need. But you got to go outside and get it. 
and then you've got to cook it. And you see, we're living in a day and an age where we feel like if it's God's will, it's going to be so easy. What are you smoking? What do you, what do you mean everything's going to be easy if it's God's will? When Jesus carried the cross to Calvary up on the hill of Golgotha, do you think that was easy? Do you think it was easy that Jesus took our sins? Do you think it's easy to always follow Christ? That's not what the Bible says. And so it's, it's rewarding, it's beneficial, and there's nothing else like it. Well, you might say, well, pastor, doesn't the Bible say, and didn't Jesus say, don't worry, God is going to, if, if God gives food and worms to the birds to eat, that God's going to take care of you. Absolutely, I believe that. And Jesus said that in Matthew 5. But I have never seen God cram a worm down some lazy bird's beak. In fact, this last couple of weeks, we've had a, a nest of birds on our porch. And the mama bird and the father bird would come and bring worms. But when they got a little bit older, they got those little chicklets out of that nest and they had to go and find their own worms. And so here is a truth, is that God has provided for you, but He doesn't cram it down your throat. He will meet you in your prayer closet. He will meet you outside when you're on your knees. He will provide for you everything you need but he won't cram it down your throat. So the question of what is it? I think God could ask that of us. What is it that you want from God? You just want stuff or a relationship? Now, with the relationship comes wonderful grapes. And so, so a lot of people have, have titled sermons from this passage, Grapes grasshoppers and giants. Now, what did the Israelite spies say? They said, there are giants there and we are not able. And they used words and all the people grumbled that believed those negative words. And they said to Moses, why didn't you just leave us in Egypt? In fact, why don't you just let us die in the wilderness? Oh, they should have never said that because that's exactly what happened to that generation because they thought like slaves. They didn't think like free people. They saw themselves as grasshoppers. I'm not sure that the giants saw them as grasshoppers. A couple of years ago, <clears throat> I was walking up the steps coming into our home and and my wife had a beautiful plant that she had paid a lot of money for at Lowe's. Beautiful plant. And I noticed all these little cuts on the leaves. And there was this huge grasshopper. It was about four inches long, maybe three inches long. But it was chewing up the leaves of this beautiful, expensive, valuable plant. And so I just swatted at it. Well, that grasshopper could fly, and it flew, and it landed on my neck. And I'm showing you a picture of it on the screen. As it landed on my neck, it sliced my neck about four inches. I'm just so thankful it didn't hit the artery. Can you imagine, compared to that four-inch grasshopper, that grasshopper going to its den of other grasshoppers and saying, I killed a giant today. And I was afraid, I was the only one home. I was afraid if I couldn't stop the bleeding, I might have to go to ER. It was amazing that this little grasshopper had the jaws of life that could just chew and chop across my neck. Now, so what am I saying? I'm saying even if you're a grasshopper, you with me? Even if you feel like you're a grasshopper, you can look in your mirror and you can say, yep, I'm a grasshopper. I'm just a small little thing without much power. Or you can choose to look at God. God is able to deliver us. 
Christ in you is our hope of glory. And so what God does is He puts His Holy Spirit within His children. And so I'm no grasshopper. I'm no grasshopper. I'm a child of the King. I am a child of our Heavenly Father. I am a brother and joint heir to the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I am walking the path that God has called me to walk, then I am blessed and I am walking in His blessing. And so they could have, they could have gone into the promised land within just a couple of weeks because God was trying to show them as they asked, what is it? God was trying to show them God provides. God is able. God provides. I don't know what your wilderness is. I don't know what your hurt is. But you take it to God and you follow Him and He will make a way. He will provide. Now, those ten spies, God was so upset that those ten influenced the rest of the folks to, to not believe and not trust and not go in and take those giants. That those ten, the Bible says, in Numbers chapter 14, they died of a plague. But all of God's people had to wander for 40 years. So they had to wander until that generation passed away, the generation that just complained, 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 and didn't look to God. Now the next generation was going into the promised land. And as they were dividing up the promised land for all the 12 different tribes of Israel, Joshua and Caleb, they didn't die in the wilderness with the other 10 spies. They had to wait for 40 years to see this promise fulfilled. And Joshua, get this, get this, don't miss this. And Joshua, he tells Moses, you can give any portion of the promised land to any of the other 11 tribes of Israel. But please, Moses, give me the hill country where the giants live. He was in his 80s, and he still kicked the giant's tail. And he conquered, because he conquered as a partner with the Spirit of God. So you may feel like you're a grasshopper, but quit thinking like one. Quit letting the words of the world and the flesh and the devil tell you that you're nothing. Quit believing the words of Satan that says you're nothing but a grasshopper. And you start believing because in your heart you believe. And by your lips you will declare that Jesus, <laughs> that Jesus is Lord. And then it is His name and the power of His name that we are made whole. And there is no other name given among men by which we can be saved or delivered other than the name of Jesus. Thank you for worshiping with us this week. Next week, we'll take a look at how Joshua led the Israelites to overtake the walls and the city of Jericho. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Father, in Jesus' name, there's somebody listening to me this morning that just needs to believe. I pray, Father, that you would give them the belief to see that they are a child of God when they receive you as Lord and follow in your path. I pray, Father, that the discouragement and the despair and the frustration and the hurts, Father, that you will wash those white as snow and you will redeem us as your people. And Lord, we know that you are preparing for us another promised land. May we believe and may we go forth and take that land. In Jesus' name, amen.